Hello there. Good evening. My name is Angela Pinali. I'm the Artistic Director for Docs in Progress, and we're so happy to have you join us this evening for this Q&A uh, for the race to Alaska. So real quick here, because this is being visible in a couple different places. Um, we're streaming through Eventive, which is a platform we use to screen and uh, stream our films, but we're also on Facebook. Twitter and YouTube. So if you've stumbled upon this and you're like, what is this? This is a live Q&A for the movie, The Race to Alaska. If you haven't seen the film yet, you still have until tomorrow to watch it. Just go to docsinprogress.org slash screening to get more information about that. Now, if this is your first time at a Docs in Progress event, welcome. We're happy to have you join us. And just so you know what Docs in Progress is, we're basically an organization that helps people tell stories through documentary films. And we do that in a variety of ways. We do that through workshops and classes, uh, through our artist services programs, like a, our fellowship and uh, artists in residence programs. And of course, through screenings like tonight, because we love to support independent, independent filmmakers and connect audiences with them. And so that's why we're really excited to have this, this very independent film tonight. Um, and before we get started, just a note here, please share your questions and comments in the chat. We want this to very much be a converse, two way conversation. Um, and another fun thing, we have the Dinner in the Doc initiative, and that is, uh, thankfully, thank you, Jonathan Bernstein, for sponsoring it. He's uh, provided a $25 gift certificate to Loca Vino, and someone's going to win that gift certificate at the end of the evening, so stick around for that. All right, now that's all of the way, let's bring the filmmakers onto the screen. We have uh, four, fo three folks joining us from the filmmaking team. We have the director, Zach Carver. We have Liev von Ulrich, the producer, and also Ian Moreland, the producer. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for joining us. And, you know, our most of our audience is based here in D.C. and Maryland. We're on the East Coast. You guys are on the West Coast. I'm so glad we could bring the coast together. So, so thanks for joining us on our Eastern time. Thanks for having us. Okay. So... Of course, we have. I have a lot of questions, and I'm just going to get started with some of my questions. And again, guys, feel free to put your questions in the chat. So, my first initial question, I'm going to start with Zach here, is how did you learn about this race? Like, how did you even know this was happening? How did you get this team going and this project going? So many questions. Can you just like fill us in? Well, uh, basically, the founder of the race, Jake Beatty, used to be my boss many, many years ago at the Center for Wooden Boats in Seattle, Washington. So I worked as a sailing instructor and I managed a fleet of small wooden sail and rowboats. And um, and then I went to film school and he went off in this other direction to, uh, at the Northwest Maritime Center and he called me after and was like, I have this idea for a race and I need to make a call to action video. And so we, we actually filmed the very first promo video which has all is where they, they nail $10,000 to a tree and blow the horn and it has a bunch of people we know rowing boats across the line. My parents are in it, like friends, you know, it's very scrappy. Um, and that's what started it all. And then I just documented it ever since. So, all right, so then, okay, talk about being at the right place at the right time and it, you know, it all working out. How did you get the rest of the team on board? Like, how did they come on? So, um, Leave hopped on in 2017. She uh, came, she started getting into adventure photography and wanted to just heard that I was working on this race. I was like, uh, so I brought her up as a photographer to just do media for the race. And uh, through some odd turns of events, it wasn't planned. She ended up on an open inflatable going the entire race course with one of my shooters and this like crazy boat driver named Tony having this wild <laughs> adventure, seeing spirit <laughs> bears, like all this. Anyway, and she's like, this is a great story. Ian and I have been collaborating on, on another film um, and, uh, and so after doing, she leave was on the race for a couple of years. And so I don't know, we just sort of developed among us, I guess it came from wanting to do the Carl Kruger movie. We, we want the paddleboarder one is doing a, a, a bigger project and we wanted to document that. And so it was like, well, we well, really, we should do a movie about the race. Yeah. But it Oh, it was an awesome movie, so thank you for making it. So, so Lee, you said if you could tell me about you're coming on the, uh, onto the project and kind of your, you know, what your role was. Yeah, um, I didn't really have. I think Zach had told me he was a friend of mine, and he had told me about the race and not having context for sailing or water, open water. Uh, what he was telling me was not really computing, you know, 750 miles up the inside passage. I don't know where that is. 
And then I took a, a tiny, tiny sailing class down in the marina in Los Angeles. And all of a sudden, the next time you told me about it, that made a lot more sense because sailing is really hard, even in the little marina. And so 750 miles of open water or in the inside passage and parts open water seemed uh, a little bit more hell raising and exciting. So I begged him to take me on as a photographer <laughs> and uh, he did. And um, yeah, I got to I got to know Carl Kruger who said uh, at one point after a couple of years, I'd been working on it, uh, that he wanted to paddle the Northwest Passage. And so I told Zach that we had to do a documentary about it. And Zach called me back a week later and said, oh, and by the way, we're gonna do a Race to Alaska documentary. And so all of a sudden, you know, we were doing two doc we went from zero documentaries to two documentaries <laughs> that's intense and so ian has not <laughs> been has not been uh in port town center up in alaska i just found this out so ian you've been involved in the post-production process is that right yeah they roped me in right around the time they said hey this is I've got this crazy idea and all the in five years of footage on i think it's like seventy thousand unique clips spread across at that point, probably like 15 different hard drives, all in a drawer in Zach's like office. And so he pulls this drawer out and it's just like, yeah, of course we're gonna, I guess we're gonna do this. Um, <laughs> and then we, yeah, we, we fundraised a little bit. We, we got a great editor, we got great music, great composer. And it was, it's just, it's been, it's been great. I mean, for our feast, this is my first feature doc. And it, I knew it was gonna be a lot of work and it was more work than I thought it was gonna be which is good and bad, like we've learned a lot, but I think it's a good process. For sure. The documentary world is really cool. I'm very happy to have landed in it. It's been, the community too has been really cool. There are a lot of cool people making docs. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Never met a documentary filmmaker I didn't like. So, all right, we already have our first question, but before I go to it, because that's actually one of my questions, uh, Greg, um, I guess, Let's, it is very complex, a story, right? You've got all these teams, they're filming themselves, you're also filming. I wanna start from the beginning because it seems like this project evolved from you already having to do some filming for the race. Like, did it's, so I'm trying to like reframe my mind that you didn't start knowing that you were gonna make a documentary. So always from the beginning, were you having teams okay. shoot for the promo stuff? Yeah, so they, you know, they hired me to make this promo video and then they, they're like, whoa, shoot, a lot of people are signing up, maybe we should film this thing. So they found this tiny little bit of budget to bring me out and they called me, they were calling everybody who ran things bosses. So they called me the film boss. Okay, <laughs> I'll go into this title perhaps. And um, <laughs> and I showed up with like me and one, I had a one, I was had enough budget to hire someone for like the first few days. And I wanted, and I, and I had the idea that I was gonna document it because it seemed historic and I wanted to make a film about it. So we approached that first year, very fortunately I think, as if we were making a feature film. I interviewed every single racer before they left the dock, either in Port Townsend or Vancouver. Uh, the idea being like, we don't know who's gonna win, we don't know who's gonna have great stories. I, so I had like an aggregate of everybody and I interviewed the founders before the race even happened. And I had people prepping and I had people in that whole like pre-race speculative space. And then, um, and then it was just me and a camera after my my partner and Husseini left. Or she she was, but what was great about her is that she didn't know boats at all. So she asked really good. I'm a sailing nerd, so uh, I, I used. She was wonderful for like asking the questions that I wouldn't think to ask because uh, you know want to seem cool or I don't know what it is. But anyway, then after the fact, the ra you know the race the organization that puts on the race is not a film organization. They're they're a wooden boat you know, a maritime center. So they weren't interested in partnering. I didn't have resources to put together a film. So I sort of shelved it, but I kept coming back every year and filming it. Uh, and then uh, my, I worked Sorry. one year. Huh? Tell me about the clip of the day. Yeah, so every, yes. Yeah, so, so what we did during the race is we made these mini documentaries about usually featuring one team or like a theme that was happening and we published them every 24 hours. So I had these two teams working, these field producing teams, me and somebody, and then like we had an intern team based in Bella Bella, that halfway point that was just like, here's a boat and a camera and a fishing lodge, go make stuff. And they, they were awesome. They came back with great stuff. So we, we, we would alternate uh, teams publishing things. 
Um, but be, because of that, we got these great moving interviews and a lot of, there was just a lot of documentation happening. And then uh, uh, Luke Gardner, who was a producer shooter for me one year, turned me on to the documentary, um, the Barclay Marathons, the race that eats its young, if you guys might be familiar with. Great film, really fun, about of this super quirky ultra marathon in Tennessee. And that's where I realized, oh, I think there is a structure. Because really what happened that first year is we didn't know what what was going to happen. And like the story, as far as like cinema, wasn't that interesting. It was interesting that the race existed, but the first place finisher lost all their footage overboard. And they won by so much that the speculative, I don't know, it just didn't have a feature film. It had like, it could have been a short, but... I don't know. So seeing the Barclays and understanding that the race was the protagonist made me think, okay, we can do this. So there, that's my story. <laughs> gotcha. Well, let me just follow up because uh, the question we have here is, you know, and if Miriam, who's our tech person, could put this to the question up on screen. Greg is asking, how did you manage the complexity, which I kind of just asked you, but you had so many people participate. How did you manage the release forms, the collection of footage from the teams and access to the race? So you've kind of already answered the access, but yeah, like how were you keeping all that organized, especially over so many years? I mean, it, some years better than others. Uh, the, so the first year we got releases from everybody because I was like approaching it like making a movie, so that was good. And then after that, the race actually put a media release into the uh, documents you have to sign to be part of the race. That didn't, however, that covered their likeness, but it didn't technically cover the stuff they shot. So after, as we were putting this together, we, we, we made a kind of, a, Ian put together like a Google form release and we got the teams that were featured to sign off that we could use, I mean, effectively their creators, you know, like I, I only, I credited the hired camera ops, but, but really like each racer with a phone or a GoPro is also a camera op on this. Right. So um, we did that and then, yeah, it's just a lot to keep track of. <laughs> well, follow-up question from Barbara is, she asked if the teams have their own cameras. Curious, because I'm dealing with having to film uh, during COVID. So she's, uh, Barbara's been sending cameras out to people. But you've already answered. So they had their own devices. Yeah. And we you could just ask them. No way to be everywhere at once. I mean, we did send boats out, and we did this mm -hmm. really fun thing. Like, Eve did a bunch of these where you do a moving interview. So you'd set, we'd have, like, a little mic pack that we'd throw to the boat in a dry bag and then they would hold, you know, they didn't even, they didn't put it on, but they would have a wireless and then we would film and drive alongside or one of my teams would film and drive alongside. Um, you also got a sponsor though. Yes. One year. In Tova, the, the camera company in Tova, which does not exist now, sponsored us in 2016 and gave like 40 GoPros or 40 in Tova cameras to the racers. Like the team Van Tucky, they all they didn't even know they'd have a camera, and they're just like stars of this thing because they just they're like, oh, let's play with this, you know? <laughs> cool. That's amazing. Um, well, Ashwin here has a question. Early on, did so again? This is like you started with one thing and then you kind of pivoted to the longer dog. When did you uh, plan to cover multiple years, or did that decision emerge later? And so, I guess at what point did you realize what year was it that you were going to make the feature film, and did anything change from that point forward? We decided to make the feature after the 2018 race. So in 2019, we were filming with an eye towards the film, but we'd already cut most of it. Like it was or a lot of it, we had a rough cut. It was not the structure we ended up using, but we had a rough cut. Um, I plan to use multiple years, no matter what, in the structure of the film, but the like, but it, it was very challenging to figure out how to do that. We had one cut where we actually, you know, we say in the very beginning, the winner is one of the least interesting things. So we tried to like address the winner really fast. We actually had a cut where they won in like the end of act one to kind of like throw it away. Like, okay, we don't care about that anymore. We know who won, we know what the records are. Let's focus on the journey. But then it actually felt like a letdown. And or we, then we had one where we had different years finishing where we'd like recap. And we finally figured out the one constant is the race course. That's not going to change. That's what everyone has to face. And so that became what we hung the structure off. So we, we had three outlines. We had the hero's journey outline, the race course outline, and the like information stream outline that we had like strung up on a big long bulletin board thing yeah and um, and that's sort of what so the, but the race course being the organizing principle really made the whole thing gel well that was my follow-up question which you've kind of already answered so 
yeah, those multiple storylines, like really having a real clear story arc, it seems so perfect at the end now that we see it. Like, of course, we, the audience, are experiencing the race like the racers do, right? We see the changing landscape. We have the changing weather. It just makes so much sense the way you structured it, but it sounds like it wasn't an immediate thing. Can you maybe just talk through the process of like how many like rounds of edits? Did you do like a lot of screenings to get like feedback? We had a rough cut that came out like right before that race, the 2019 race, and it was not what we wanted, but it was really interesting. And some of the, some elements are definitely still in the film, some segments and the ending, like actually the ending is one of the first things that editor Greg King showed me and he did an incredible job um, sifting through this to find beautiful moments. Um, so we had that ending and we were like, we want to earn that ending, which also had the joke after of Kentucky. So we knew it had to be profound and then take the piss out of it. And, um, and he'd also, the structure, Greg also wanted yeah. to start with the, the, the first person footage from the racers. Yeah. He and I kept just tagging anytime someone opened the camera and turned it on. And then he put together that little intro of, of all the people opening up. I was really, we really wanted to make you comfortable with this kind of footage. And we wanted to, so we were really trying hard to be like, this is fun, we want you to engage, this is people filming themselves, get get comfortable with that. And then we also wanted to get comfortable with the many different years uh, early on. So we, and I was really stressed about that. We had at one point were color coding all the, the tags for the years and I, I just was really worried that people would be like, wait, why are we in 2016 now? Why is this back to 18? But if we felt, if we kept the course consistent, the years could work on it. For a while, we thought, oh, we can maybe change all of these things, but we had to keep, we had to keep moving north. If we, as long as we kept moving north, it kind of worked. Well, I think it definitely works. So, you know, yeah. I, I told you the the team this before we got on that I was just amazed at how you guys handle it because it seems like so perfect. So, um, so kudos. Um, we have a comment here from Miriam. She just says, "What an amazing film! I feel so inspired to pick up sailing, which is always a nice byproduct when people want to go sailing." Yeah. Uh, do you know where some of the teams are now? Are they racing this year? Um, I'm. I don't know where they are exactly. We're doing another, there's a new, they, the, we can't reliably go to Canada yet. So uh, the race has decided to do a different thing. They're calling the Washington 360, which is um, 360 miles around the Puget Sound area. So it's, it's as, basically as far as you can go, but stay in Washington waterways. Um, and like Sail Like a Girl was yep. gearing up, Gene is gearing up for that race with a, some of the same crew and I think a few new ones. Yeah, Katie Stewart does it every year, so she's in. For yeah, sure. Katie's doing it solo. Oh, she uh, is. Yeah. Um, who else? Yeah, several of the racers are coming back for sure. Mathieu, who's in Lightboat, the the Frenchman, he's over in France, obviously. Yep. Oh. No traveling. Love... There's a lot yeah. of coasters that have done the race too, so. That's cool. Well, thank yeah. you. So, Lee, maybe I can ask you some more about the Kickstarter. Were you involved with that? Because I did, you know, read that you guys ran a very successful Kickstarter. And just curious about your thought process. Obviously, it takes money to make a movie. <laughs> and I'm not sure that's how you guys raise some of the money. <laughs> uh, but if you could just talk about, like, you know, why you guys decided to do that. And, and I think, because I think we do have some filmmakers in the audience watching, like, what was the secret to your success, if you don't mind sharing it? No, of course. That's a, that's, that's a huge part of filmmaking, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and even when you're doing a scrappy film, you know, it takes an ungodly amount of money, what feels like a lot of money. Um, and uh, so we were lucky enough to have a community to kind of touch base with first. We're doing this documentary. You support the race. You love the race. Wouldn't you like to see the documentary of the race? <laughs> and so there were, um, we had sponsors from businesses and then we had um, private investors um, who were excited about just um, contributing to the project and, and um, wanting to see it in the world basically. Cause you know, none of us are gonna get rich off of a documentary film most likely. But um, it did have a good community. And we thought down the line that a Kickstarter would be good once the film was all, was kind of ready. We had like a rough cut and we just needed like, you know, the finishing stuff. And so, um, yeah, we were lucky that some people work deferred. And so we were able to kind of get a pretty good rough cut by the time 
we really needed to nail down, um, you know, rights with legal stuff and the music stuff and all of those things that you think are so small that end up <laughs> being huge. And um, we were lucky enough, someone put us in touch with um, Howard Marks. Howard yeah. Marks, and he is a uh, Kickstarter yeah. guru. He's we a former have, copywriter. Uh, yeah, and yeah. but he just does Kickstarter campaigns and he walked us through it, held our hand, walked us through it and uh, made it a fairly painless and lovely uh, experience that, yeah, we could just share with, I mean, it was fun to finally say, Hey, we're so close. If it was basically, it felt basically like um, we were just kind of saying, do you want to buy the film before <laughs> it's out? Right. Like right. just, you know, this will give you the film. And that's basically how we thought of it. And um, actually we had great, we talked, we got great advice. We, we called the filmmakers of the Barclay marathons um, because we were, we, we talked to their editor at one point and stuff and um, they had done a Kickstarter too. And they gave us that advice and some other filmmaker friends I know of like, don't do it until the Kickstarter money is a vital and like, uh, that is it best to complete the puzzle with the Kickstarter than start the puzzle. Mm because you you can really deliver to your community um, whereas like if you start the puzzle with it then you're you might be years until you you kind of come back and you don't have that engagement um, that's a really good point yeah never thought about that that's great um if i could also ask about the music and maybe i'll ask ian about this because i know you do have original compositions for it i think i heard it <laughs> i'm like i heard that it was already a reggae song about alaska i'm like i don't know what this <laughs> is and i know time to look it up could you talk tell us a little bit about that yeah, so we, from the outset, music was really important. I'm actually the music editor. I have, so I have a background in post audio, so I was excited to do it. And then that, it be, again, becomes a lot of work, but it's like, it's a lot of fun to be hands on and not just, like, I felt like I was making something, you know? And like, my, uh, my girlfriend was our music supervisor and she works in the like music and entertainment business. And so she helped us license a few of the tracks that are licensed in the, in the film. She also got us our composer Spencer, who's from Minneapolis, where where we used to live, and um, so I would say Spencer scored about fifty minutes, or maybe even sixty minutes of like original composition for the movie, which is our executive producer. When we told her, she she said that's that's an ungodly amount of music for someone to score for what you got, like for what you guys are. And we're like, well, he did it, and it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, like we're I'm pretty happy with it all. But yeah, we got um. An original reggae track from someone in Dane Houston? in Austin. Who? Dane in Austin. Dane. Oh yeah, Dane. I don't Dane. know who his vocalist was, but yeah, we yeah. sent them. that was really fun. They like threw that mm -hmm. at us and um it was and, like, my, my friend um Lee did the credit song, the uh at the very end, not the beginning one. And then like the editors editors uh friends are actually the opening credits music. So it's kind of like now that I'm saying it out loud, it's just like we called a bunch of our friends and then they called their friends and it it sounds pretty good. Ian did a great job. I mean, Ian's musical background was super helpful. It's That's always been a challenge for me, like learning to talk about, talk to composers about score because it- You have to I, like build a language because it's- Music. I know how to talk about narrative, but- um, we ended up finding a language. You always kind of end up finding a language. Um, but Spencer did a great job in the end. I, I'm so stoked about it. Oh, yeah, the music phenomenal. So, so we have a question from Janet. Um, what can you share about the distribution strategy of the documentary? Do you organize screenings with sailing clubs, and would you do it again? And I'm oh, guessing yeah. making the movie again. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I would make it again. Would you guys make it again? Yeah, 100. percent it, it's been such a privilege. And, and so about the distribution, what are your plans? I know right now you guys are playing festivals and screenings like ours. Mm -hmm. There are different ways to go about it. There's definitely the, um, the more homegrown kind of eventive is now a platform where you can do set up your own screening, um, virtual okay. screening stuff. Um, there we I mean, unfortunately, we weren't able to go to a lot of the film festivals in person, but, um, you know, we've done seminars where they talk about what your um, impact strategy is. So you can always, for a documentary, where do you want to screen it? 
do you want to screen at universities? Do you want to screen it at, um, you know, like the question said, yacht clubs, sailing clubs, those type of things. Is it educational? Can you sell it to schools? Um, there's a million different ways to do it. Or you can get like a, a standard dis distributor um, who might get you to Amazon or iTunes or Netflix or, you know, if you're right. lucky. We're, we're sort of trying to do all of those. But um, we, we do have sales agents attached and they're, they're, they're out there doing their best, which is exciting. Um, but that process is, well, I don't know, it's new to me. So um, then we also, yeah, we're doing private screenings. So uh, we've done some for yacht clubs. We'd actually love to do more of that, you know, kind of reach our core audience. And uh, and because of the virtual screenings or hopefully later this summer, you know, we can do either at least outdoor type screenings. Um, that's something we're open to. But because of like distribution, you don't, we don't want to be, we need to be part of a festival or a private thing until that's, Pretty. Um, right. But like, it's been really fun to, to do some of these Q and A's. We did one with like a really fun with Half Moon Bay Yacht Club up on the California coast, and they had like a women's sailing initiative, and there were just these like cool, cool women that were into sailing and loved the movie. Yeah. So like, we had some great experiences with that. And, um, but yeah, we're hopeful. Yeah, hopefully yeah, that's the point too. You know, to to show the film and to get to have an audience response to it and. Yeah share it and be a part of that is right that's the point for me that's the most fun for sure if, if janet wants to uh do a screening she can email me <laughs> and my, my email is on our website so and what's your website uh the race to alaska.com thank you because <laughs> i didn't remember it so yeah. we have another question here from karosh uh great film y'all how much of the time went into the kickstarter campaign versus how much did it raise so could you share, you know, some general info? It raised 40,000, which is, we're very grateful for. Um, how much time went into it? About $40,000 worth of time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Surpri yeah. A surprising amount of time suddenly went to a, to something that was not the movie to get the movie made, but it it's worth it. I could I mean, not quantify it if you asked me that. I don't know how much time. We definitely worked on it part time for several months. Right. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. And there were weeks that were like it felt pretty full time. And we had Howard doing, you know. Doing yeah. Howard was instrumental. We would not have been able to do that without. Yeah. I don't think he's the only campaign manager, but that was that was spectacular. It's really good to have somebody that's familiar with the platform. Well, and also someone who doesn't know anything. Like Zach mentioned, there was a a camera person and who doesn't know a lot about sailing. Like Howard knows nothing about the movie or sailing. He doesn't have any darlings. He's just like, well, this is how people are gonna perceive it. Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm seeing. Is this is this close to what you guys are saying or want to say? And sometimes it wasn't, sometimes it wasn't, but it's was nice to have someone kind of reflect back what we mm -hmm. were trying to do to us to, to mm -hmm. go out with it. Yeah. So I have a follow-up question here from Ashwin. You don't have to answer, but if it's all right to ask, what was the over overall cost to make the movie? Hmm. We don't have to answer it. <laughs> I'm just going to post it, you know, because I think there is definitely the cost that we don't, I don't know, filmmaker to pay ourselves for our work, right? And we never quantify that, right? Like, Zach, all your time and leave and Ian, like, all that time's not really going to get compensated. And there's a time of the actual expenses, right? You've got to pay things out. Um, so I always think that's a tricky number anyway, right? Like, yeah, it's a hard one to say because, like, for instance, the race paid me a little bit to make content during the race, but then the race is a nonprofit and they have all this volunteer power. So like one year we had volunteer helicopters. So like how much is that heli shoot? You know, those that's okay. 100 a day, 2000 a day just to have the heli like plus like the, so like we had that for, for four days one year. So that's like a $10,000 right. bill at least, but I didn't have to pay for it. The race didn't like have to pay for it, but that's part of the budget. We, right. we, in our fundraising, we kind of attempted to quantify how much we think it would have cost to make this film to incentivize people to invest in it, to say if they're getting, you know, a movie that would be several hundred thousand for less than that. But um, right. still, it's still a good chunk of change to make a movie like this. Isn't wow. it? Yeah, yeah, we could tell. Um, so we're almost out of time and I want to start wrapping and I'll leave, you need to leave real soon. But real quick, yeah. I always like to end on this, if you have time to answer it, like, we know you would do it again, but what's like the takeaway for you? You know, like what's the best part of having been a part of this film? And, and we could start with you. 
I before think, you? I mean, it definitely changed my life. It it kind of pointed it in a different direction, and it seemed to with. Uh, my adventure photography, I was an actor at one point, I just started shooting and producing and it, it just kind of took all of the loves in my life and it wrapped them all together. And um, yeah, it was, it's the best thing in the world. I'm so glad that I got found the, the documentary world. I'm so grateful to Zach for bringing me on and Ian for being such a good team member and, and friends, you know, like that's the best part. It, I get to do something that I really love and then get to share it with people and get to see their films. And I mean, hmm. gratitude all around. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, I love it. <laughs> well, I know you have to leave us. So thank you so much for joining us. It was really thank nice so talking to you. Yeah. I'm gonna go, bye guys. Bye, Lee. But don't bye. leave yet, the rest of you. Okay, so Ian, I'm gonna kick that question to you. Your big takeaway, you know. No one's asked me this. I probably should reflect. Um, I feel like actually because of we, I had never made a feature film. It was just nice to prove to myself that we could make one, and it's good. Like I think it's objectively good at this point, which is like you don't not a lot, a lot of people get to say that. Um, like it gets a lot of love, and so we're really appreciative, and it's it's uh, that's great. And then. I don't know how people could do this if, like we've said, the friends, like, I don't know how we could do this if it was not with friends. Like, I'm really, I don't, I'm astounded that any movie gets made ever. Like, the fact that more than one movie is out a year is just impressive to me on its on face value. And so if, if people are doing that without their friends around, it's got to be the worst thing in the world. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we did it with a bunch of people that we, we like and we hang out with all the time. Thank you, Ian. And, and lastly, Zach, you're a big takeaway. I mean, I think like it, it hit me, this is gonna sound kind of dumb. Feature films are long. And like that, I knew that, but having never made a feature, I've made a ton of short content over the years. It was really a great challenge and, and like kind of to prove that we could do it, but also to like, really engage and understand the process of how long it is and how the, the it's a very different set of demands. So as far as just like learning, I feel like I learned so much about what makes a narrative, what holds attention and what, what, you know, what can build a story? How do you structure a story over that time base? Because it's a very different, it's just a very different set of concerns at that point. And then like the dominoing effect of changes and, and those sort of things. So was, I just learned a ton. And, um, but also like, it's, it was incredibly satisfying to make a film for a community that I was a part of. Um, like, I want this to go, I want as many people as possible to see it. I think they will enjoy it. I think most people will get a kick out of this movie. So I, I can't wait for it to be in the bigger world. But to make something that, like, celebrates this community that I've been lucky to be a part of, that I'm, I am truly inspired by, has been pretty rad. So I'm grateful for that. That's and awesome. It's like... Of course, and now you're so ready to make the next movie, right? I feel like you've learned all this, and now you can like do. I think you're gonna do a better job. It's gonna be a little bit easier. At least that's what I tell myself. So yeah, I just I'll probably <laughs> try to do something harder. Is the problem? <laughs> there you go. So, um, all right, we're about to wrap up. Thank you, Ian and Zach. Stick around because you get to be part of this giveaway here we've got coming up. Thanks so much, though, for um, just sharing your time. And we did have one last comment. Uh, just thanking you for your perspective and your candor answering the questions. So thank you. And, and thank you for making the movie. It was very enjoyable to watch. I definitely felt very uplifted and, and you know, optimistic, right, yeah. about humankind. And I think the way you ended it with that great quote from that gentleman that I can't remember his name, but I mean, yeah. got fun again, right? Like, I, I always thought that's what I really enjoyed is that, the, you know, you'd get kind of sentimental, but just kidding. <laughs> just enough, right? Like, just enough, which really goes with, like, kind of the tone of the race, right? Like, it just felt really true to the experience. So, um, so thank you to our audience for joining us this evening. And like, as I promised, we're going to give away a gift card, but real quick, I just want to let you know what's coming up next. We have our next screening on May 25th at 7 PM and we're screening our bodies, our doctors by Jan Hawken. And that is about the rarely discussed story of what it means to be an abortion provider today, confronting the threats of violence and facing intensified political threats and efforts to criminalize abortion. It's a film's a little bit over an hour long and Jan will be joining us for a Q&A. 
if you want to make a movie and you're not sure how, we also have some workshops, including our intro to doc projection. We also have a 55 plus video projection class. Check out our website for that information. And now, thanks to Jonathan Bernstein, we're going to give away that gift certificate to Loco Vino. And so this is kind of like lo-fi and you guys are going to laugh. So just I got to get to share my screen for this. Um, there is a website called Wheel of Names. <laughs> oh, there we go. Here it is. And I put everybody's name into the wheel of names. So, oh, there it is. Okay. So all you do is hit the button. Here it goes. Um, and so the lucky winner for the $25 gift certificate to Loco Vino is, oh, it looks like it's CJ Krim. <laughs> CJ is, uh, congrats, CJ. CJ is part of the Jackson Parks community. I will email you about that gift certificate. Thank you all for joining us this evening. We hope you stay well. And we hope to see you at another event soon. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.